Okay, let us, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word and we thank you that it is a lamp unto our feet, a light for our way. And we just pray, Lord, as we're looking at the book of Revelation and the, the final end, that we might really be inspired about that story. We not fret or worry about the future, but know that the future is in your hands, um, that you have prepared a place for us. Um, you know, as Jesus says, in my Father's house, there are many mansions, you know, so we just pray that you have secured our place with the blood of your Son, and so we would just pray that you would give us that peace and security about the age to come. Amen. Amen. So today is our, our final message as we've been just going through um, from the beginning to the end of the whole Bible. So that's quite an accomplishment, isn't it? It was rather, you know, fast in various places. Um, but that's okay. You know, that's, that's okay. Yeah, understatement of the, of the day there. Um, covering sort of four or five books in one go. But um, yeah, we got there in the end. Um, and over this whole series, I've said a number of times, I've quoted Paul in Romans, where he says in Romans 11, 36, that um, for from him, through him, and then to him are all things. And it's this big sweep of history, that everything comes from God's plan, happens in this world of history, and then goes back to him at the end. That God is, as we, you know, we're reading in the very beginning of Ephesians today, that his very plan and purpose for each one of us and for all of the human race, so would, he would unite everything under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So that's his plan from before the foundations of the earth, and then it just sweeps into history until the final end. So God is the final destination of the whole story, which I think is a lovely way just to think of the end, that it ends in God. You know, Paul says that God will be all in all. You know, that's how in Corinthians he says. So here we are, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When all things are subjected to him, that's the Son, then the Son himself will be subjected to the one who subjected everything to him, so that God may be all in all. So the end goal of history is that, that God is the end of history. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 to 11, we read, So that in the name of Jesus every knee will bow, whether in heaven, on earth, under the earth, Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so that's where we're heading. That's sort of the end goal of history. That every knee will bow, every tongue will confess and give its allegiance to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, who is of the God the Father. Okay. So when thinking about the book of Revelation, we have to think that's the end of history. Okay, so we interpret the book through that lens, um, but also it's, it's an apocalypse, it's an unveiling and it's signs, symbols, lots of numbers with various meanings, and so we can't take everything just at face value, as it were, because, you know, otherwise we're talking about dragons, we're talking about multi-headed beasts with various horn numbers and all these other sort of things, you know, there's great imagery, um, but it's not to be taken literally in that sense, you know, there's not going to be a red dragon who comes down out of the sky, you know, um, in that sense. So these are symbols, they're pictures, they're images, to try and describe various things. But the whole of the story really is a symbolic vision that seeks to reveal a heavenly picture, or the heavenly perspective on history in the light of the final end of God being all in all. Uh, I had thought about, you know, what about showing some of the Bible Project videos, you know, and then just sort of tapping on the end of what Tim Mackey said, but the two Revelation videos are 24 minutes long together, so <laughs> that was like all my time, you know, used up in one. So, yeah, no, you wouldn't mind it, that's great. Um, so, if you want to check out sort of Tim Mackey's perspective, then 
they're on there, check out the Bible Project, and you can see his breakdown. So it's 24 minutes long, I didn't think it'd be that long, but obviously it's a big book, lots of, lots of things to come up. So Revelation begins, Revelation 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must happen very soon. He made it clear by sending his angel to his servant, John. So this is a book, uh, it's a revelation. So it's signs, symbols, it's a, a revelation of what will happen soon. And soon is a very, you know, on God's timetable is, you know, any amount of time, isn't it? You know, it could be thousands of years, or it could have been in their lifetime. Um, so it's a revelation that God has given Jesus to share with his servants. So that's the Father giving it to the Son. And it's important to notice that there are a number of different ways that Christians throughout history have interpreted the book of Revelation. There's a historical view that it's a broad sweep of all history. Okay? Uh, there's the Preterist view, in which basically all of it happened in the first century AD. And this is a symbolic way of talking about the destruction of the temple and the events of AD 70. You know, so that's one way to look at it. Um, and it's about the fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, then there's the futurist way of looking at it. It's all about future events. It hasn't happened yet, but this is going to happen sometime in the future. And then there's the idealist or the idealism way of viewing it. But it doesn't refer to specific people or events, but it's a, an allegory of the ongoing struggle between good and evil that happens in every generation. So it's as much for us as it is in the past. So it, it did happen in the first century, but then it also happens in every century after that as well. You know, there's there's beasts in our generation just as there was beasts then, you know. So there's a variety of ways of looking at it. And so there's also, just to make things even more complicated, there's a, a thousand year period mentioned in Revelation 20 verse 2. And there's three ways of looking at that. So there's the pre-millennialist way, which is uh, holding that it's a literal of thousand years in which Jesus is physically going to be reigning from Jerusalem. Then there's the, the amillennial view, which is that it's an allegorical uh, way of talking about Christ's rule over the present age with his saints in heaven. Um, and then there's the post-millennial view, which is both literal and allegorical, which views the second coming happens and Jesus reigns, but after the whole world is gradually converted to Christianity. Okay, so that view was very popular a hundred years ago when the Protestant Missionary Society was sending people all over the world, you know, so as you can imagine. So these three views go in various popularities over time. Okay, but all that's to say, this is a very symbolic book. The numbers often have symbolic meanings, and so we have to be careful about taking things too literal. Okay, this is a book of symbols, don't get carried away, you know, that there's, you know, giant locusts suddenly going to be released, you know, with women's hair, heads and things like that, okay? So, just focus on, you know, that these are symbols, they're archetypal things, okay? So, chapter, or there's frog demons that are suddenly going to rub from the Euphrates or something. Um, so chapter 1, verse, chapters 1 to 3, follow seven letters to seven churches in Asia Minor. And these are letters from Jesus Christ writing to his churches. Um, and he calls them to return with a promise. And the promise is that those who overcome in this present wicked age are going to be rewarded in the age to come. Okay, and these are promises for, for each of us then, aren't they? That if we live and endure and triumph in this age, despite the wickedness, despite everything that's going on, then we will have life in the age to come. And I'm just going to list the promises, because I think it's good to just to list the promises. So, the first one, to so the one who conquers, I will permit him to eat from the tree of life, 
that is in the paradise of God. Second, so the one who conquers will in no way be harmed by the second death. Number three, to the one who conquers, I will give him some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and on that stone will be written a new name that no one can understand except the one who receives it. Number four, to the one who conquers and continues in my deeds until the end. That's an interesting turn of phrase, isn't it, talking about what I said at communion. To those who continue in my deeds, you know, the... They, our deeds are his deeds, aren't they? You know, so those who continue in my deeds um, to the end. Um, I will give him authority over the nations. And then there's a quote, a messianic quote about Jesus. He will rule them with a rod of iron, and like clay jars, he will break them to pieces. Just as I received the right to rule from my father, I will give him the morning star. The one who conquers will be dressed like them, in white clothing. I will never erase his name from the book of life and will declare his name before my father and before his angels. Number six, the one who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. He will never depart from it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name as well. And then number seven, I will grant the one who conquers permission to sit with me on my throne, just as I too have conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Okay, so there's some mighty promises there, aren't they? You know, the, and uh, Paul talks about these things as if they're already a, a reality, doesn't he, in Ephesians, you know, that we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. You know, that Jesus here is saying, you know, the one who conquers, and they will have, they will rule in the age to come, just as I'm ruling now, you know? So these are seven promises for the one who overcomes the present world. And they should motivate each of us. You know, Jesus tells us we should be motivated by these sort of things. He says, you know, do not store up treasures on this earth where rock moths and rust can destroy, but store up treasures in heaven. You know, it's, it's not a bad thing to be motivated by trying to get rewards in the age to come. It isn't it's not what it's about, it's about God, but, you know, it's about we will be rewarded for what we do in this life, okay? And so Jesus says, the one who conquers, I will give permission to sit with me on my throne, just as I too have conquered and sat down with my father. One of the uh, reoccurring themes in the book is the difference between hearing and seeing, okay? <clears throat> hearing and seeing, and there's a difference I think this is it's a great example, but it's also for us as well, in this present life. That what we see in the world and what God says about it and that we hear are two different things. And I think that's an encouragement for us as well. So in Revelation chapter 5, uh, verse 5 and 6, we read this. Then one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Look. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has conquered. Thus he can open the scroll with its seven seals. Then I saw standing in the middle of the throne of the four living creatures, in the middle of the elders, a lamb, and that it appeared to be killed. So John hears, he's told, look, the Lion of the tribe of Judah who's conquered. And yet when he looks, what does he see? He sees a slaughtered lamb. Okay? And often in this life, our experiences can be like a slaughtered lamb. Mm -hmm. We can feel that people are against us, particularly if we're being persecuted or in, um, you know, however else it might be. But what is spoken over us is something different. You know, that you're a son of God, you're a child of God. Okay? So here we see John hears about a lion who's conquering. What he sees is a slaughtered lamb. Okay? And often that is how it is. You know, I mean, the martyrs, isn't it? We can think about the martyrs in the book of Revelation. You know, they're given crowns, they're given rule to reign over the nations, but they're the ones who've been killed for their faith, aren't they? So they, more than anyone, you know, are the slaughtered lamb that is the 
triumph of the Lion of Judah. This happens again in chapter 7. John hears about 144,000 sealed from the tribe of Israel, but then he sees an enormous crowd, too many to count, from, made up of people from every nation, every tribe, people and language. He hears of Israel, but he sees a crowd made up of every nation. So the centre portion of the book is chapters 6 to 16 that covers seven seals, seven trumpets, seven signs or symbols, and seven bowls. And these signs and these symbols loop around. They're not all in a chronological order, they loop around. And they all finish with the day of wrath, or the day of God sort of appearing and triumphing over his enemies. And the trumpet should immediately remind us the plagues uh, remind us of the plagues of Egypt. And it is God delivering his people, delivering the earth from, from Egypt. Okay, So that's symbolically what they're trying to say. You know, this is God rescuing his people out from Egypt uh, amongst plagues. And we have visions of beasts and Babylon, which are signs of the world's empires. And then in Revelation 13, verses 16 to 17, we read this. He caused everyone, whether small or great, rich or poor, free or slave, to obtain a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. Thus no one was allowed to buy or sell things unless they wore the mark of the beast, that is, his name or his number. And this calls for wisdom. Let no man whose insight calculate the beast's number, for it is a man's number, and his number is 666. So here John mentions the mark of the beast. Um, which is on the right hand and on the forehead. And, you know, there's many things that people say today, you know, microchips or COVID vaccines, barcodes or whatever else you might have heard. But chiefly, it is an anti-Shema, which I'm going to explain. But in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 8, we read this. And this is what Israel is told, uh, well, Moses is told by God to say. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So that's Israel's creed, that there is one God, one Lord. Um, and you must love the Lord your God with all your whole mind, with all your whole being, with all your strength. These words I'm commanding you today must be kept in mind. And you must teach them to your children. Speak them as you sit in your house, as you walk along the road, as you lie down, as you get up. And you should tie them on your forearm and fasten them as symbols on your forehead. So Israel is told, literally, to get that command, the Shema, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. To bite it, bind it on their hand, and bind it on their forehead. And you see Jews today, don't you, with those little boxes. Mm. And in those boxes is written the Shema. And then, so they wrapped it around and they put it on their arm and on their forehead. And it's basically them sort of keeping on their mind, keeping in their actions that truth that God is one. And basically he's saying that the beast will come and when the beast will effectively get another creed, something else, and tell you to wear that. Okay? So it's not literally about someone being implanted in your skin or anything else. What it's about is allegiance and the beast calling for allegiance to another creed where he's basically saying, I'm God, worship me, or whatever else it might be, okay? Remember, this is a book of symbols. We shouldn't take them too literally, okay? So it's about giving allegiance over to Satan, really, okay? And the symbols of finance and empire and things like that. Babylon is a symbol of all the world empires that have ever been built upon the blood of other the innocent. So it's Babylon, it's Tyre, it's Eden, it's Greece, it's Rome. But that means it's also the Soviet Empire, the American Empire, the British Empire. You know, the beast is a symbol of every empire that has ever existed. And all empires are ultimately systems of oppression. They're beasts that devour the innocent at the bottom. And they're archetypes of rebellious against God. And I think it's good to remember in the present political situation how true that is as well. You know, it's not that Russia is evil because 
we did exactly the same things in the last 20 years, you know. And the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan were against the UN, you know, they didn't have any sanction to do it, it was declared illegal, you know, but, you know, we shouldn't point the finger at others and say, look what they're doing, and we've done exactly the same. Okay. All of us have failed in that sense. We all have our systems of empires. And the book leads up to a series of images and symbols that speak of the final battle at Armageddon. Um, many commentators think this refers to the plains of uh, Medigo. Uh, I prefer a different interpretation, just, um, just to let you know. But Armageddon comes from Har-Megedon, from Hebrew, which meaning the Mount of Assembly. I think that makes the most sense. But it's about Mount Zion, it's about where God's throne is. And the final battle is effectively at Jerusalem, where God's throne is, where, and it's a battle for the throne of God. A battle right there at the very centre of all history is a battle to enthrone a false God, um, where God alone should be enthroned. And the battle takes place in chapter 19, and again in chapter 20, either side of the millennium. So we've got this thousand year reign of Christ, um, so we could have a literal sequence of events where there's a big battle, then Jesus reigns for a thousand years, then there's another big battle. So it could be that way. Um, or the thousand years are symbolic of God's rule and reign over the heavens. Okay? So we don't, you know, you can take it either way. Um, as I said, it's a very difficult book to understand. You can take this any number of ways you want, really. And that's why you do have so many, particularly American pastors, who are constantly saying, you know, this is what this means, this is what this means, this is what this means, and then they change it five years later as the political situations change. Um, I was just saying to Ashley, you know, when I was when I was growing up, you know, we were all told that Gorbachev was the Antichrist, you know, because he had the, the mark, you know, on his on his thing. But you know, he's dead now, and you know, it's the end of it's not the end of history. So. Um, People have lots of speculations, okay? But this is a book of symbols that are very difficult to understand. Okay. What is certain is at the end. Jesus will return as king. He will defeat evil once and for all. He will be vindicated and he will vindicate his followers. And he will give them rewards in his kingdom. Um, so that's what's certain. Okay, that we will rule and reign in the age to come with him. I think that's important to remember. You know, ultimately that's what it comes down to. However it pans out, you know, there's people who claim I'm a pan-millennialist, it will pan out in the end, you know, and it's just it's that <laughs> idea, isn't it? That, um, at the end, what really matters ultimately is that um, Jesus is king and he will rule and we will reign with him. Okay? And each of us have a choice. Do we follow the beast and its symbols and the world empires, uh, the systems of this world, or do we follow the slaughtered lamb, okay, and his way of defeating those kingdoms, which is a way of suffering and a way of death. And so throughout all church history, the church so often is given the option that Satan gives Jesus, you know, come and follow me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. All you have to do is bow down and worship me. And this is a temptation for our world history, for Christians, to say, you know, let's take the kingdoms of this world and make the whole world Christian, rather than the way of the suffering lamb. Okay. So there's that, that battle. So in Revelation 19, we see an image of Jesus returning in power, and we read this. Then I saw heavens open. And there came a white horse, and one riding on it, called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and goes to war. His eyes are like a fiery flame. There's many diadem crowns upon his head. He's a name written that no one knows except himself. And he's dressed in clothing dripped in blood. He's called the Word of God. This is important, isn't it? That the Word of God isn't who Jesus is, it's a title of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the the subject, the word of God is a title. And he's crowned with the, that title, but he's dressed in clothing that is already dripping with blood. 
This is significant because the blood that he's wearing is already in heaven, isn't it? That he's coming down. So it's not the blood of his enemies. It's his own blood. Because he bled and died for the sins of the world. So when the judge comes, he's coming wearing robes dripping with his own blood for the sins of the world. This is a judge who died for his enemies. And that is a comforting truth for all of us, that the one who does the judging is the one who loves us so much that he would die even for those who are his enemies. <clears throat> it's the encouraging word for all of us that when we do sin, when we do mess up, that we don't fear the day of judgment because we know that the one who does the judging is the one who loved us, the one who cares for us, and that the Father loved us so much that he would send his son to die in our place. So regarding the judgment, again, because the way Christian history has worked out, there are again three views within Christianity, and all three views have been there since the very beginning. Um, the majority view is that hell lasts forever, and that we're aware of it, that those in hell are aware that they're in hell, and that it lasts forever. The kindest approach to this is, as C.S. Lewis says, that hell is not from the inside, you know, and that we're ultimately there because we've chosen to reject God's kindness towards us, and that therefore, you know, we're the ones who are keeping us from life and peace because we rejected God and we've carried on rejecting God forever and ever. The minor views are annihilationism and universalism. Um, so the most famous evangelical uh, annihilationist was John Stott in the recent past, uh, English churchman. Um, and annihilationism effectively says that only God is immortal and so God will raise to life the righteous but the wicked will stay dead. And that's the second death that John spoke about in the book of Revelation. That they cease to exist. Um, so that's, you know, annihilationists will often quote John as the second death. So the lake of fire burns things up. So if you've got fire at home, you know that when you put a log in it, the log doesn't stay there, does it? It gets burnt up. And so the idea is that when things go into the lake of fire, that they're burnt up and they cease to exist. Okay? Nothing will remain. The fire is a fire that consumes. Uh, and the third one, and so the most famous evangelical universalist today is probably a guy called Robin Parrow. He's again British. There's a lot of British people here, isn't it? Um, so that holds that in the end all will be saved, however the wicked will be punished for all of their crimes. And their punishment might last thousands or millions of years, not that if you're in eternity you're measuring time, but, um, but in the end they will be released and they will be saved. So there is a blazing furnace, there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, but it doesn't last forever, because in the end, the death is paid. And so evangelical universalists will often quote Jesus in Matthew 5, 27, where he says, I tell you the truth, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. Or Matthew 18, 34, in his anger, the Lord turned him over to the prison guards to be tortured until he repaid all that he owed. So we have the image of a, a lake of fire that is there until everything has been paid. You know. Okay. So however we choose to view the lake of fire, it's not a nice image, is it? Not a nice image. And it's a warning for our need to trust Jesus in this present age when we can make a decision and that he will judge us and on that day he will recognise us as his followers. You've been doing my actions in the world. So in Revelation 21, verses 2 to 4, we read this. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, made ready like a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, 
The residence of God is among human beings. He will live with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will not exist anymore, nor mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have ceased to exist. What a wonderful way of just summarising the age to come. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. <coughs> Death will not exist. No mourning, no crying, no pain, for the former things have ceased. Revelation 20, 24, the nations will walk in its light. The kings of the earth will bring their grandeur into it. And I think it's important just to remember here, you know, that this great city on the new earth, you know, and you've got kings who are bringing their grandeur into the new Jerusalem. Who are the kings? They're not the kings of this age, but they're the people that Jesus has chosen to rule in the age to come. And Jesus says about the kingdom that the least here are going to be the greatest there. And the greatest here will be the least there. Mm. So where it says the kings of the earth bringing in all of their riches, all of their glory to Jerusalem, those kings might be peasants or whatever in this life, but in the age to come, they're going to be the kings who are ruling over the nations. Jesus talks, doesn't he, in Luke's Gospel about, you know, um, based on how much he's given, the talents. And he says, to this one I'm going to give rule over five cities, to this rule over ten cities, and to this one to rule over one city. It's the idea that we're reigning with him in the age to come. But we need to have proven character. You know, God's not just going to give you... Know, the problem with this age is that the kings often have bad character, don't they? And they do terrible things and commit atrocities. But if God's going to have kings who are going to rule for eternity, they need to have good character, don't they? So that's what he's doing in this life. He's shaping us to rule with him in the age to come. Um, next one, Revelation 20. To verse 2, on each side of the river is a tree of life that's producing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month of the year. Its leaves are for the healing of the nations. And this is important as well, that it's not that when we get there everything's going to be fine, but also that healing is going to take place. You know, that the leaves here are for the healing of the nations. I think all of us have been through this life, haven't we? And we might need a little bit of healing in the age to come. Revelation 22, verses 14 to 15. Blessed are those who wash their clothes so that they will have access to the tree of life and can enter into the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone else who loves and practices falsehood. So here we've got an image of the new earth, we've got the New Jerusalem, we've got this city where kings and the, the people of the earth are bringing in. And we're told that only the righteous can enter into the city. Only they can take the, the special leaves. But we're told that outside of the city are the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, murderers, idolaters, etc. People who love falsehood. So however we understand the fire that burns or whatever, we have to factor that in. To our view, okay, the outside the city are those who practice falsehood. Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 to 11. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's where we began, wasn't it? That's where we're heading to, and in verse Corinthians, I'm just going to say it again, chapter 15. For he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be eliminated is death. And when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will be subjected to the one who subjected everything to him. So God will be all in all. And if we go to Ephesians chapter 1, which we read earlier, verse 4, he chose us in Christ before the foundations of the world. And then verse 10, uh, this was all towards the fullness of times to head up all things in Christ, the things in heaven and the things on earth. So God's plan from the very beginning in all of history is to reveal everything.
everything to be united in heaven and earth under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Okay? So everything, all of history, has been for the purpose of eternity. So that he's creating the rulers who will rule with him in the age to come. And he's doing that in this present age, as we have our faithfulness to him, as we live out our lives, and he's shaping our character. And that's what Paul says, you know, in Romans 5 and in other places, you know, that this present life is producing in us character for the age to come. Okay? So our sufferings in this life, we should consider pure joy, even though we don't feel like it, um, <laughs> because it's producing in us an eternal weight of glory that Paul says doesn't compare to this present life and its sufferings. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this vision and the vision of the end, that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we just thank you that you, Father God, are going to be all in all and that in this present life you're transforming us to becoming like Jesus Christ. That he's the first among many brothers and sisters. That we will be like him when he is revealed. Amen. Amen. Rashley, you got some...